when putting money away for your financial future, could doing too much of a good thing actually cost you? Well, on Consider This Program, my managing partner of the Financial Enhancement Group, Joe Clark, and I are going to actually talk through when too much of a good thing does happen, it can actually have negative effects on you. And more importantly, can doing what you're told actually affect your financial situation adversely in the future? Find out what we mean and let's dive in this together and consider this program. We're happy to have you here. Look forward to continuing the show. Good morning. Welcome back to Consider This Program. I'm your co-host, Grant Sullivan, Manager of Advisor Operations for Financial Enhancement Group. I'm Joe Clark. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Happy to be here. <laughs> I threw that one on you. Hey, no worries, man. So I, I, just for all of us, I, I've been used to just kind of saying, you know, he's he's here with me, and I kind of threw him in the, under the bus there. I apologize, Joe. But when it comes into our conversation for this morning, getting into it, can doing, can being prudent, can doing what you're told, can doing too much of a good thing actually affect you negatively? And so um, Joe, in, in his infinite wisdom and what he did when I was a student 12 years ago at Purdue University, used case studies to really help seal a point um, in, in his education style. And I think it's worked beautifully here on the radio for many of us along the way as well. And so uh, this case study I want to bring to our, our situation is, and this actually probably happens to many of you, right? When you're saving your money in a 401k and you're purchasing investments, right? Um, they always tell you, put money away, put money away, put money away. Um, don't change anything, don't change anything, don't th- change anything, and always do tax deferral. Because when you retire, you're going to make less money. right? That's what we have been beating into our heads for years and years and years. And so you get to the, the stage of distribution. And when we have families entering a transition, or even sometimes a trigger, and they come into our office, and they say, hey, Grant, my transition is I'm I'm finally turning in the keys. I'm, I'm getting ready to enjoy your life after work. You know, how do we do this? How do we turn this into income for my family and I? Or they hit a trigger and it's, hey, the government has made a decision and now I no longer have a job or I've lost a spouse. You know, what do we do from here? Those are transition and triggers. And so looking at what we're trying to accomplish with prudence, you know, one of the saddest things we see, Joe, is when a family comes in and said, I did exactly what I was told. I have all this money I sacrificed along the way. I did the heavy lifting, right? Let's take a look at my financial situation. What does it look like? And then we have to be the bearers of bad news to tell them, oh, by the way, you did a wonderful job. You did exactly what you were told to do. But the IRS got you, and they're going to be standing at the end of the finish line. And we tell when we tell them how much they have to pay in tax, or when we tell them that it's actually prudent to get rid of the single holding they've been holding on to for 30 years because it was their job and they were tied to it, it leads to a lot of emotional stress. And so what we want to do in the show today is talk through Sometimes doing what you're told and being prudent may actually cost you in the end. So, Joe, I would love for us to kind of go through uh, GM as an example. I mean, I, you dealt with this for almost a decade. Individuals holding on to an investment because that's what they're told to do. It's what they were informed to do, putting money into tax-deferred accounts and then watching money evaporate to the IRS in a market condition. If you don't mind going through that, I think it would be helpful for the discussion. Yeah, we can do that. But let, let's – um. Let's take it back to stuff that that everybody everybody knows. I mean, the idea of being prudent simply means doing something that is wise, right? Making making wise decisions. Should you save for your future, Grant? Yes. Should you drink water, Grant? Yes. Should you drink too much water, Grant? No. You can harm yourself by drinking too much water, right? And and that really is you know, the, that really is the point of, of, of prudence really is an understanding that what goes in must come out. And whether it's an investment that you're making into your 401k or to a Roth IRA or into a savings account, what goes in must come out. Now, some people will say, well, Joe, it doesn't must come out. I'm just telling you it will come out. Either you're going to enjoy the money or your heirs are. Um, and along the way, the IRS is going to get their fair share of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And so what happens, and, and it doesn't happen as often anymore because of 401k plans and, and things that are out there, but what used to happen a lot and what you have to be very, very careful of is getting emotionally attached to a company. So <clears throat> I'm going to use my uncle. Uh, he didn't listen to the radio show, and um, so it's not going not to offend him. He worked at Chrysler. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember when my aunt and uncle moved the money to the financial enhancement group, probably in 1997, shortly after we started. I remember my aunt look at me now. Remember, your uncle is very conservative. 
right? And, you know, we'd just gotten through the Iacocca days and everything else, you know, the, all of the, the, the problems that, that Chrysler had gone through. And I get his retirement account statement, and 80% of it was in Chrysler stock and 20% of it was in cash, mm. right? Now, in their viewpoint, they were being very conservative because these crazy stocks go up and down all the time. I have no idea what's going on with them is what he would say. But when Chrysler stock went down, I could go to work and I could see the, the steel. I could see the tires. I could see the cars. You know, and there was an emotional attachment, right? The same thing happened with General Motors at the turn of uh, into Y2K, where People said, you know, I will never sell my GM stock. And then it got to a certain price and started to fall. And the statement at that point in time was when it gets back to, which it never did get back to, but when it gets back to this price, then I will sell it. I've, I've learned my lesson, right? And I've watched this in my career with Caterpillar. I've watched it with Lilly. I've watched it with General Motors. Obviously, the last one turned out worse than the other two. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it's, it's that emotional attachment that we can get to, a, to any, any company, any one place. And so when you understand that you're putting money in and that it must come out, you want to build the most uh, effective mechanism for being able to make changes inside of your portfolio along the way. And it's always fun to hit home runs. A hundred percent. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing to talk about owning Apple stock, right? Um, you know, you know, and at the, at the time of this recording, we own Apple stock. So I, I mean, you know, but it, it doesn't mean that we were, you know, able to forecast what Apple was going to do over the last 15 years. That's not the, that's not the case. Right. right? So there is a book out there that gets a lot of traction. Um, my two famous business books that you should never read, um, that are bad are the Beardstown ladies. Um, and, and that's because they couldn't do math and they got found out by a CPA on national television. Uh, the other one is the millionaire next door and the millionaire next door would counter everything that Grant laid out in that first part. Mm -hmm. And the millionaire next door went through and studied people who had, um, bought a single holding or a single sector and it became very wealthy, right? What the author either understood or just didn't understand one or the other is a mathematical thing called survivorship bias. Mm -hmm. You can only study the people who are left, right? And all of the people who had multi-million dollar accounts, the millionaires next door, who held on to a single stock, all seemed to own the same stocks. It was the baby bells, right? Right. In the in this case, there were nobody who held railroads that were in the book that said I made all of my money by holding the railroads because they'd all gone bankrupt, right? It's you know, so survivalship bias is a big issue that you have to pay attention to. And when you're building a portfolio, you do want to pay attention. You want to be prudent, but prudence not just in finding something that goes up 50% a year, right? You all, we all want our best returns, but you want the most flexibility that you can have in a plan. That's prudence. Absolutely. And, and Joe, and I appreciate you telling that story because when you tab prudence and you need to combine it with wisdom, or when you combine it with wisdom, good things happen. So here's what we know about Congress and the IRS. They're prudent as well. And <laughs> I'm trying to keep a straight face over here. <laughs> and when I say prudent, I mean they their job, their their how they come out and grab resources from us to build bridges, to build railroads. They're good at that. And when we are prudent but we lack wisdom, bad things happen. GM, for example, on the downside, on the upside, in the million next door, for example, when we have families that come to us and they're they have wealth they've accumulated wealth, but it's isolated to a handful of single investments, that creates some interesting problems tax wise, because and we've all either we've all been through this at the end of last year where we had the current administration potentially adjusting taxes and increasing capital gains rates. So let's put aside tax deferred money, Roths, IRAs, 401ks, et cetera, and let's talk about owning Apple for 30 years and never letting go of it. We, we never knew it would be here, right? No one could have predicted that, but it is. And if you're not, and if you're not adding wisdom to prudence and knowing how to deleverage yourself from the asset once you get into distribution and you get married to it in a way, sometimes letting it go becomes a problem because – Today, under our current tax, under at the time of this recording, under the current tax code, right, capital gains tax is zero, fifteen, and twenty percent, 
with uh, a 3.8 surcharge that goes on top if you're over a certain level of income. And they were going to blast those numbers even higher. So when we don't mix taxes, remember, guys, investing in taxes don't belong in silos. They need to go together. And when you combine those two together and you put and you add wisdom to prudence, right? So Joe's example is beautiful. We know we need to drink water. Having too much water can be a problem. And this is that example. Having too much of a single holding can be a problem as tax codes change, as things change down the road. And then when you throw back in tax deferred assets, meaning money in an IRA or 401k, that's going to be taxed in the future when you take distributions and you have these two issues compounding against each other, you're really doing the IRS a massive favor and yourself a very little favor. So understanding that prudence is important, but understanding that things change and you have to be able to adapt when things change is crucial to financial security. Because like Joe said, down markets, equity changes can lead to some serious problems and devastation. But the IRS is the one organization that will separate us faster from our money than any other. And if you don't do things together, you're going to end up in some pretty big trouble. James Clear wrote in Atomic Habits, success is never dependent upon one thing, but failure can be. And, you know, it, this, this wasn't to try to scare you. It's not to try to tell you to go take your whole portfolio and just go liquidate it all at one time. Please don't do anything like that. Um, it, it is to tell you that we need to think about our future and the reason we talk about the fiduciary focus in every meeting that we have is because it's not just risk and volatility. It's not just fees and expenses. It's not just the taxes you pay today and tomorrow. And it's not just inflation. It's all of those. And failing to recognize that all four of those can create a, a literal plane wreck. Um, you know, the title of my book is, is Retirement Runway, right? And, and it's because we have to land the plane. We've got, to, we've got to be able to use the assets either for us, our kids, our heirs, our charities, somewhere that the money has to be used or we wouldn't have saved it. Hey, go to yourlifeafterwork.com, 800-928-4001. Get signed up for your Next Steps meeting. Grant will give you 90 minutes of his best thinking on things you should consider today, things you're going to want to consider in the future. And if you choose to pardon together, what FEG will do for you, and he'll put it into writing.